healthy and I'm, um, I'm uh, affiliated at a number of the other programs at, at the business school, for example, at um, BU. And also there is a PhD program at BU, which is for rock stars um, called BU Urban, which brings together all kinds of uh, faculty. And it's really an effort to break down the silos and be more multidisciplinary in our approach to solving climate change. I'm a co-leader on a focused research program, which just launched in July for the year on combating climate mis and disinformation. And um, Tyler, I don't know if you would like to find that and just put that link into the chat um, because it is sponsored by the Institute for Global Sustainability. It includes faculty from about six different areas of the university. So this is the first time we've done this. And part of the of winning the, the grant was, I believe, our expansiveness and our desire to include all corners. So at, at a big university like BU, like some of the other places where you work, um, and when you go for grants, this is just a thought to keep in your head, is that a lot of the funders are now looking for partnerships and collaborations and decrying the dearth of collaboration, even the International Energy Agency ahead of the COP that's going on, that's just winding up now in Egypt, um, decried the lack of international collaboration and partnership as a real key flaw in, in making uh, significant progress on this issue. So it's beginning to get called out. And I think we can all be part of the solution there and just be incredibly inclusive and diverse in our thinking when we think of all the different kinds of voices and talents and skill sets that can be at the table. So for example, for this focus research project, we have, um, we have the core faculty working on it, uh, as you will see, but then we have a community that we described to our, to our funders in advance of receiving this grant that would include people from the religion and theology departments, the hospitality and tourism school at, at BU, the, you know, just all these different food and nutrition so not just data science, not just communication, not just engineering, not just environmental science, not just public health, but also mental health and, and business. Um, because honestly, then we were able to, I think, respond to the call um, of this particular grant. And these grants are becoming more and more aspirational, I believe, as you see everywhere from the Rockefeller Foundation to the Bezos Fund to Bill Gates, et cetera. When you're going for this money, it's really important, I think, to, to uh, collaborate with partners who you might not have worked with in the past and try to come up with new ways of approaching these problems that are so pernicious and that are not going away ever and um, that need uh, every kind of new, fresh approach. So um, about four years ago, I noticed in my own social circles of friends and family that I could absolutely scatter a room if somebody asked what was I really, really interested in, and I said climate change and solving it. They would just change the subject. And these are people not in our academic fields or in our circles of solving climate change. These are just normal people in the United States today, mainly. So I started thinking, well, there must be a better way of communicating about um, climate change. And now I'm going to share my screen, if that's possible. Are you giving me permission to do that, Tyler? Uh, yes. So tell me if you can see everything. Can you see that? Yes, we can see. Um, okay. It's like the entire thing, even the uh, notes. And yeah, I'm going to get rid of that entire thing. OK, so how to talk about climate change so people will listen. Um, what I what I'd like to do is just buzz you through the presentation. So what I what I do when I give a talk is to level set everyone where one on where we are in climate change. First of all is that the science is settled. Experts agree. Believe it or not, the executive director of this land trust where I gave this talk on Monday night said, are you going to actually mention climate change? <laughs> I said, yes, I am. You know, the science is settled. So we're going to start from there. It's a dire situation. Urgent action is required. The causes are understood. Be very different if the causes weren't understood, right? Solutions have been identified. 
Uh, roadmaps have been verified. Policies are emerging. We have this nearly 400 billion now that's been passed into law. Thank you. Coming from our own federal government. Investment is flowing as a result. A friend of mine who directs the policy for the Bill Gates Breakthrough Energy Fund said that it's just a, like drinking out of a fire hose now. All the money that is coming into those funds and then quickly being deployed out into projects that are all about the clean energy transition across 20 20 sectors um, the Department of Energy has, has identified everything from batteries to um, soil enrichment to um, obviously solar and geothermal and hydropower, everything you can imagine. Um, mainstream media coverage is improving, but it's a tough uh, story to cover as we can get into. And there's a wonderful organization called Covering Climate Now that if you're interested in, um, you ought to have a look at. I don't know if you've had anyone from there, Tyler, speak to you yet, but it might be a great mentor chat for next year. And then public awareness and support, of course, are also growing. Let's see if I can get out. This hang on. That slide was problematic. I apologize. So here we go. This is one of my favorite um, ways to show where greenhouse gas emissions comes from. This is from Project Drawdown, which again, I'm sure you all know. And if you haven't had anyone come speak to you from Project Drawdown, I certainly recommend that as well. They've got some great design going. And this just shows that it comes from everywhere, just in case somebody thinks that it just comes from one, one source or another, um, that just about every single area of our modern way of life involves greenhouse gas emissions. So no matter where you work or what you care about, you should be able to find some aspect of this issue that concerns you and that you can contribute to. I'm sure you all know that it, this is very expensive and that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is part of the Department of Commerce, quarterly comes out with this map of billion dollar weather and climate disasters in the United States of America. This one is the one that was published at the end of 2021. And now it should be possible to go to this website of, of NOAA, NOAA, and um, find it where are we for the first three quarters of 2022. So of course, no surprise, some of, and you all know this because you are some of these people, some of the smartest people alive on this planet right now are concerned about this and working on it. They heeded the, the comments from the IPCC, the UN's um, convening of the world's top scientists in 2018, who said, you know, we really only have 10 years uh, to, to, to address this properly. And they said that in 2018, that got a lot of people's attention. And whether it's exactly on the button, you know, in exactly 10 years, we don't know. We don't know exactly when some of these tipping points are going to begin to happen. Um, it may be sooner, maybe later. But the point is, we can still do something about it. And we can do a lot to avoid the very worst impacts of climate change, which are mapped here by a consulting firm called Verisk Maplecroft. And it just gives you an idea of globally how much risk we are introducing into our lives by continuing to fail to address this, this problem. You know, last year, um, greenhouse gas emissions again spiked 7% globally. So we're not going in the right direction yet. We haven't bent the curve. And for, um, I've forgotten who it was who is who is dealing with viruses. I think it was Julie Simpson. So viruses, I think that the coronavirus taught us all, gave us all a masterclass on science communication because it gave us tools like those graphs that show how you can bend the curve. Do you remember those graphs? So that's exactly what we need to do with our emissions. And this is a whole sort of vocabulary that now the general public has. So I think as science communicators, we need to really jump on that and, and really begin to, to get pretty confident that we have an educated public out there. So of course, Americans worry about global warming is at an all time high and I'm, I'm sure it is around the world. I chose to just use Americans 
This is a group that I work with often, the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, along with the team at the George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication, has conducted this long-term study uh, about American attitudes regarding global warming that is called the Six Americas. And basically what they've done is divided us into six buckets. And four years ago, when I began to really get concerned that people I knew either weren't alarmed about climate change or were alarmed about climate change, but didn't know what to do about it. And that I myself was unable to really spark a conversation even among my most trusted and talented friends and family who weren't focused on this, that this was a terribly awkward subject. And for many reasons, I mean, it's frightening as hell for one thing. Um, I began to look at this, and it is heartening to me to see that the dismissives on the right and the doubtfuls are really a small portion of the American population, but they're very vocal and in some cases extremely well-funded because, of course, they're protecting their vested interests in many cases in the fossil fuel economy. I mean, think about it. If you owned a chain of gas stations... And you're and and you don't want to maybe you don't want to have to change over to be battery charging stations. You want to remain a gas station person, right? So you're going to stay dismissive, like it's not happening. Um, I'm going back to that just one second. So the alarmed and concerned when I started my project four years ago added up to 51%, which is why I call my project the 51% project. That's the total percentage, just a slim majority, uh, which appeals to me as a storyteller, because 51% means, you know, a couple of degrees this way, and we're, we're making progress. But a couple degrees that way means that we aren't alarmed and concerned, and we won't have the public support that we need for the policies and the investment and the new technologies that must be underway and that are underway now. So I'm happy to report that this uh, data set, which came out about a year ago, shows that we're a little bit higher than 51%. This one says we're at 58%. So that's good, but it's not 99%. And so we still have a lot of work to do. So I decided I would go and see if there was any expert peer-reviewed literature on the subject of climate change communication. And indeed there is. And if you Google Scholar climate change communication, you too will find that there are over 10 million peer-reviewed um, you know, scholarly papers on the subject, but they remain basically trapped in an academic vault. They haven't made their way um, to the mainstream communicators of our age. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna boil them all down like a balsamic reduction and see if I can come up with say 12, an easy dozen principles that we can use. So the first one is to talk about it. And if you read Catherine Hayhoe's book or any of the other climate communicators or science communicators, you, you know that talking about a problem is one way of normalizing it. And so that is a very um, rudimentary first piece of advice. The second is to use trusted messengers. And so when, um, let me see, Taryn, who works at the Ch Chicago Botanic Gardens, and also, oh my gosh, who is it who is it in Indianapolis? Aaron, you guys are such trusted messengers, um, and you know this. Whatever you say, people will tend to believe. You're in an enormous position of influence, but we're all trusted messengers. Here is a delineation that the Yale George Mason team did in advance of the um, sort of run up to the midterms that we just had in this nation in April. And they went and asked liberal Democrats all the way across to conservative Republicans, who do you trust on the subject of global warming and climate change? And you'll see that NASA is, is the most trusted, reliable source. And luckily for all of us science communicators, we can go to NASA, we can go to NASA's special climate portal and follow them on Twitter and on Facebook and every other which way and, uh, and know that 
you're reaching a broad audience when you use um, stats and facts from NASA. So that's great. And I'm, I'm happy to give you the source of this if you'd like to pour over this later. And I also wanted to, to mention that as, as partisan as this subject has unfortunately become in this country and other countries as well, um, that the younger you get, the less of a partisan divide there is. And of course, why not? So this same study, if you drill into it, finds that voters age you know, 18 to 35 the, the lines really begin to blur between Republican, Democrat, you know, younger people totally get it and they aren't as, you know, tied into these um, old ways of thinking. And so that's a real bright spot. But we, you know, given what the scientists say, we really can't wait for everyone to grow up and some people to die. <laughs> so uh, we need to move on to the next principle, which is keep it simple. And you all know this, this is a primary uh, principle of science communication. If you're dealing with a mainstream audience, you can't expect them to learn things over and over again. Um, I like to show this slide because I'm passionate about this long sweep of history that uh, our subject of climate change encompasses. And to show that, yes, there are peaks and, valley, uh, peaks and valleys in the atmospheric carbon dioxide load but that only in the past, say, 66 years has it really started to spike and get up above this parts per million level, which is uh, measured, as I'm sure you all know, by the observatory in Hawaii at Mauna Loi, um, where, you know, maybe at the turn of this century, they said, you know, we really don't want to get up above 400. Well, now we're getting close to 420, everybody. So that's just an indication that we are we're really getting into some art uncharted territory here. Um, I wanted to point out that there's, I have a little pet peeve about um, the metric system. I'm American and I, I haven't become fluent in Celsius and meters and kilometers to say nothing of kilowatts. But when we have um, a, a world that except for the countries in blue on this map, which are the United States, Myanmar, and I believe that's Liberia on the Western coast of Africa. Those are the only countries that deal in Fahrenheit, everybody. So we have to, we have to but what I beg scientists to do is if you're going to use um, Celsius, why not just include a parenthesis about Fahrenheit, with the Fahrenheit equivalent, if you really want to make this information accessible to people, and or why not write us some fabulous piece on how to become fluent in the metric system? I mean, I think we'd all appreciate that and make it animated and fun, and it will go viral. So there's an idea for you. There's The Economist. That's a mainstream publication that's read by all kinds of people, including you know people who are very well positioned to be helpful with, in the situation, people who are in business, for example. And they may lo just look at that 1.5C and say, what's that if, they're, if they were educated in the United States? So number four, we were talking about this earlier, having a sense of humor. Tyler, you have a stand-up comedy class. That's great. Why not do something about climate change in that class? And if you do, why not tune in to the guy at the University of Colorado named Max Boykoff? Have you heard about him? Um, yes, I'm sure you have. So he's got this long-term project and, and students who are into to comedy are, they're doing, I think it's called the, is it called the Greenhouse Project? At any rate, they have a contest every year. They have winners and it's it's terrific. I personally totally commiserate with everyone who says there's nothing funny at all about climate change. I mean, there really isn't. Um, but by lighten up, I mean more it's a matter of tone. So if you're talking with, say, your grandmother about climate change, you might look for something that's just a little bit more friendly than that than that graph that I showed you of the past 800,000 years, you might tune into someone like this Nicole Kellner, who I just discovered on Instagram the other day, who has made this alphabet of climate change terms. Print it out, bring it to Thanksgiving dinner and talk with her about it. Now there's a great story for an article and it was, who was it who said that she's writing um, 
op-eds, but not enough. I forget who that was, but whoever that was, I think she was in North Carolina, maybe. Um, but at any rate, a great story every year is about family holidays and how difficult it is to talk about climate change. I guess I, I kind of have a penchant for that subject because that's what happened to me that made me want to start my 51% project. I was like, if this was a car, I would take it to a mechanic and get it fixed. There must be some expertise. And indeed there is. And that's what I'm trying to share with you right now. So another example of tone is this marvelous free of charge Axios Generate um, newsletter that I get every single weekday in my inbox. This is November 14th edition. So they give you a little bit of like how, how much time you're going to be spending on this five minutes. Great. President Biden in US Indonesia, da, da, da. Then something from Bloomberg. And then always a nice rock and roll tune to sort of start your day when you're opening your inbox and this thing arrives, plops in my inbox like 8 a.m. And I've got a song. And I just think that's a really nice touch. Thank you, Axios Generate. And it's this, these two guys are rock stars. If you don't know them, you might want to follow them. Okay, principle number five, respects the science. I, for one, have very little patience for people who don't respect scientists. I figure scientists have saved my life, you know, 90 different ways and engineers and people who have you know, engineered my car so that it's safe or who have created vaccines so that I don't die. So I think we saw some, some discord on respecting science that also emerged during our COVID era, but it's one of the principles that I share with people. And so when you want to kind of document that scientists do care about climate change and that they are furthermore 98% scientific consensus on the fact that human activity has caused the greenhouse gas problem and that it's not going away on its own and that we need to take urgent action in order to combat this problem. So um, and if people say, well, so that's a 98% scientific consensus, what about the other 2%? And you can say those 2%, if you look into it, might be um, funded by the fossil fuel industry or the American you know, um, Petroleum Association or something like that. So really and truly, the science is settled and scientists are all about this. And you know this. So number six, again, this is not rocket science, everybody. Share reliable resources, of course. I keep a list of the ones that I like on my website here at this link, but you know what they are, and you are those reliable resources. Um, seven is land the one-two punch, and this is again from Behavioral Science 101, which is that when you have bad news, try to balance it with good news, and, when, and sometimes lead with the good news. So, um, for example, here we go. We're going to see headlines all the time um, that use the one-two punch. Stopping climate change is doable. Good, but time is short. Bad. So uh, try to go for that balance when you write your headlines and when you structure your pieces. That if you're giving bad news, also give some good news because there's plenty of solutions and most people don't realize it and don't realize the extent to which these things are being funded and deployed, and that the smartest people are beginning to take this extremely seriously. And really, it's a race. Use compelling images. And so what's a compelling image? Some people will say, oh, yeah, just use a before and after picture of a glacier and show that it was like this, um, you know, 50 years ago, and today it, it, the glacier doesn't exist. For me, um, that's not as compelling as the stories of human anguish. Um, this woman um, is in Greece. I'm sure you all saw this picture and she has had to abandon her house where she has lived for 50 years with her husband who is trapped in the house. So, and he's about to die. So that's a picture of pain that gets me. I've also heard lots of people say that pictures of polar bears notwithstanding, which, which, which have proven to be, you know, not effective in terms of engaging people because that presents 
climate change as a then and there problem instead of a here and now problem? Because you're thinking a polar bear, I would never see a polar bear in my backyard. And that's way far away somewhere, except for maybe. Um, it's also not an accurate one. The like number of polar bears hasn't been shrinking, for example, since we outlawed hunting them. And so, so, and so there you go. Oh yeah, and, and triggers, no. triggers a lot of people about the accuracy. Exactly, exactly. But wait, I, I was on my way to saying that um, the pictures, I don't know if you remember the photographs um, when Australia had that horrible season of wildfires with the kangaroos and the little koala bears getting singed. Those apparently had a huge effect on people. Now, there is a scientific-based organization um, in Europe called Climate Visuals. It's part of Climate Outreach. And they have researched the question of images over and over again. They have a library of images that you can use and review. And I think there may be, it, part of it might be absolutely free of charge and part of it might be sort of member access only, but it's not that expensive. But at any rate, what one thing they found was that a very effective um, set of images is that which shows not only solutions, but people working on solutions. So show a whole team of wind turbine technicians, which is by the way, one of the fastest growing jobs in the United States and is predicted to be for the next 10 years, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So no, no surprise again that, you know, here I am with Project Drawdown um, on their solutions landing page on their website. They've, they've got a bunch of climate solving um, engineers, which is tremendous. This is another compelling um, image uh, that you will all recognize, the blue marble. And so this is the picture that has been replicated so, so many times, perhaps the most reproduced image in history. And it is, um, it is a remarkable image because it has produced what behavioral scientists call, call a cognitive shift, the overview effect. And you've probably heard what astronauts say, um, there haven't been that many astronauts. I think, I think I don't know, a hundred. How many people have actually seen the earth from outer space? But Mike Collins, an Apollo 11 astronaut typifies the response of the overview effect, this cognitive shift, which is oddly enough, the overriding sensation I got looking at the earth was, my God, that little thing is so fragile out there. Imagine if we could all just flip a switch and have that overview effect in us and cognitive shift. And it all it struck me last year when these images from the new Webb, uh, James Webb Space Telescope began coming back. This one's called Cosmic Cliffs. It's a landscape of mountains and valleys speckled with glittering stars, the edge of a nearby young star forming region in the Carina Nebula. And honestly, I thought again, how small we are and how perfect our planet is. And if you can guide your audience somehow to that perspective and help them understand that this really is the only planet, guys, it's planet A, we're not going to Mars. If we did, we wouldn't be very happy there or Venus or Pluto um, or anywhere on this gorgeous landscape of cosmic cliffs. Um, there are four more um, principles and I'm just going to buzz right through them and then because I want to have a QA and a and I see we're running out of time. So you know about the, the climate stripes, no doubt. And if you don't, let me know, but look him up, Ed Hawkins, a scientist in England who basically has plotted the average temperatures of the earth all the way to the current date. And he's also done projections out based Based on certain scenarios, like if we get to 1.2, if we get to 2.7, if we get to, God forbid, 4.5, and he's using some pretty dark reds at that, at that point. And you can go to his website and configure this for your own location and time frame. So it's a great database. Um, and I think that it's free. So you can suggest those to your editors as you publish your pieces. Take bold action, obviously. And 
Um, but and the reason that I think this is this is important to overstate is, and those of you who are in a position of, of being trusted messengers, and that would be all of you, is to remind people that um, you know even though you might get a little depressed just bringing your own re reusable mug and nobody else is, or pulling down your shade before you leave your house on a very hot day so that so that the hot sun doesn't make your house even hotter than it would normally be or your office if you're leaving for the weekend and nobody else is doing that, that can be terribly dispiriting and it can get you in a very depressed kind of a state. And by the way, we haven't mentioned eco-anxiety, but the American Psychological Association for the first time at its annual meeting in May is proposing consideration of eco-anxiety or climate anxiety as a diagnosable clinical disorder in their Bible of addressable disorders for mental health professionals. So that's another angle. And I mean, why not? As I said before, I mean, this is just, this is scary as can be. Um, so take bold action, deal with deniers. I'm not so good at dealing with deniers. I just want to box their ears. But um, if you have better ways of doing that, please do. I was reminded the other day by a friend who told me that Paul McCartney recently said, you know what? I have when I'm when I'm asked why am I optimistic, I I I say you know there are an awful lot of good people in the world, and I tend to think there are more more good people than there are bad people. So remember that chart that I showed you of the six Americas, showing that tiny under ten percent percentage of dismissives and and deniers. You know they're dug in. I gotta believe most of them know that they're wrong. And so I almost think we need to like show them a little bit of loving kindness, but that's not the view clearly held by people who, you know, um, would like to, you know, really do away with them all. I I, I am more conciliatory. I'm more. Uh, I'd like to. I'd like to help people get there, but I'm becoming very impatient with the delays and the delivering dithering, and that gets to remember the money. You know, we have to remember that hundreds of billions of dollars and trillions of dollars are at play here and we have to move the entire global economy from where it has been invested for the past half a century to a whole new clean energy transition this is moving mountains everybody and we're doing it as i said some of the smartest people on the planet are involved with this lots of them have been in egypt last week and this um but you can't forget that, that we're in the real world of dollars and cents and that incentives and, and efficiencies and saving money is what people want to do. And we can't be asking people to do things that are more expensive and that won't perform as well and that will be inconvenient. And number 12, the final principle that I'd like to mention is to bring it home. Be aware of what people care about who you're communicating with. You know this as well as I do, and I'd love to hear your stories of of how you might do that. So here are the 12 principles. My designer, bless his heart, just finished this. And so if you go to my website, you're only gonna see, I think eight of them. Um, so bear with me, I'm, it's, it's a work in progress. And I hope that um, this has been helpful um, to you and, and thank you very much. Thank you so much again, Sarah. Um, at this point, we will open up the floor um, for questions from you all. Um, um, I I will start one. Uh, have you noticed um, like a change kind of in climate communication, especially with social media? Um, just because I feel like during the pandemic, um, there was kind of like a boom of science communication via Twitter, especially, um, and then now I maybe because like the pandemic is over or because of Twitter's happenings right now, I'm just seeing mm. kind of a, a fracturing of that. This was another little curveball that we did not need was for some guy to come swooping into Twitter and just, you know, take away all the guardrails. So I don't know what to tell you about this. I mean, I'm in a terrible funk about this. I'm I'm extremely active on both Twitter and LinkedIn. And I'm wondering whether LinkedIn might not emerge as a better place for professionals. And we could even consider making a Psycommerce group there. 
um, if if you'd like and have all the mentors check in from time to time and, and have that be available for all of you. I like LinkedIn a lot. I, I, I think that people, I think there are just fewer wackos in there and maybe the Russian bots haven't figured out how to get in there. Um, I don't really, I don't really know, but I do know that I, um, I still rely on Twitter in order to follow my very favorite scientists and policy people and leaders in this movement. And I haven't seen that they're going anywhere yet. Um, so I guess stay tuned on that one. At least for like three more days or something, right? <laughs> I know it really does put a little pit in your stomach, doesn't it, Erin? It's just it horrible. Does. What what social media? I would be interested in what social media all of you use. I mean, I abandoned Facebook. I just like couldn't do it anymore. But do you use Facebook, Erin, for you? I, I, I do because I'm older and I uh, have been on there for a long time and that's how uh, family and friends contact it professionally? Is. No, I use it for family and friends and then I have a okay. Twitter account for um, where I connected with scientists and psychom people and um, other people yeah. and I made yeah. a LinkedIn account years and years ago because it was a place that students could connect with me and that was not me sharing my personal life so um, those right. are the three that I've used, but they're for historic reasons. And I have an Instagram account that I don't use. And I think it's awkward just because, um, you know, it's like streaming services. Everybody's using different things for different purposes and um, yeah. it's, it's hard. So, um, yeah. yeah, I guess all the Twitter people are thinking about moving to Mastodon, but I don't understand it and I don't really know anything about it. Or I don't need it. Yet, so I'm Mastodon not very, is yeah, I'm not interested in figuring out something new. If the whole thing breaks apart, I'll probably just go read read more books and walk exactly. more. I don't know. <laughs> Till the next thing comes along. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question? Well, not a question exactly, but I'd like to give a shout out to uh, TikTok as a social media platform yes. that is very yes. up and coming right now. Um, I know I'm probably yeah. being very stereotypical of my generation right now by saying that I'm on the older end of no. Z, but, uh, I have a Twitter, um, that I am trying to become more active on. And I also have a LinkedIn that I'm very much, uh, recently trying to become more active on, but that's still a sphere that I'm just getting into. But for TikTok, I don't make posts. I don't make videos, but I do follow a lot of science communication professionals. I follow a lot of other scientists and grad students. And from the student perspective, it's a really fun and unique way to really distill our science communication skills in a way that is uh, attention grabbing for a more general population where you can really communicate large amounts of information in short snippy bite sized pieces. I like that part about it a lot. So uh, if you're not involved- That in is it, great. Make, maybe make an Thank account, you. just poke around on there. Um, I think it's a lot of fun, so. I just put this in the chat, but we do have a previous mentor chat from um, early 2021, like specifically about using TikTok. Um, it's with Jada Elcock. Um, it was really good. I'm pretty sure it is um, posted in our community resources document, but if it is not, then I will make sure that it's available for all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, I guess I did write my question in the chat, but I can say it out loud. <clears throat> I was wondering if you have any um, ideas or proposals in, in, in which we can include concepts and approaches like citizen science to uh, involve non-scientists into the dialogue. Because as a scientist, the, the reason why I was drawn to science communication, which I know is a very broad term, um, to me, when I talk to even my family members, most of whom are biologists, by the way, when I start speaking about what I do, I get so technical <laughs> that yeah. it's to them what I do is challenging, even yes. more challenging when I am talking to somebody who's, say, in finance. So even yeah. though people are, you know, uh, very, very polarized about climate change in, I, I would say, a good, good way, um, meaning that they do believe that a dialogue is required, how do you make you know participation a fun and b effective that's just a great question um and and i i mean 
I think that citizen science, the opportunities for people to become involved, th this is an area where we can all be trusted messengers as well. So for an example would be, uh, you know, if you're aware of a local meeting or a conference or a film or something like that, to actually invite someone who you know is in this space to come with you or to watch it with you or to go with you to the meeting or the town meeting or even like in, if you have a book club to bring up a book that you think might bridge the gap there. And there's so many of them. Um, I, I, articles. I don't know. I, I I think I read a statistic that said that um, a certain just horrifyingly high percentage of people who are concerned about climate change haven't really done anything about it because they haven't been invited to. <laughs> and I think that, you know, so we can all sort of it's on us um, to to come up with ways. And it might be a great thing to make sort of a database or a resource bank of success stories on how we make these connections. And again, it's a great topic for a piece of reporting, I think, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So I do actually have a, a quick question here. Um, so one of the tenets that you talked about in your presentation was, was the importance of sharing reliable resources while yeah. you are communicating about climate change. And I think that that idea and that necessity really translates to talking about any kind of science, really. Right. But the idea of reliable resources has become really fraught politically in mm -hmm. the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And this is an issue that I've run up against, not even necessarily in formal science communication, but in speaking with friends and distant family that uh, I don't communicate with often, where I'm trying to talk to them about a really important issue related to the pandemic or climate change or something yeah. like that. And I will share my information backed up with sources that I fully believe are credible, such as Dr. Anthony Fauci or the NIH or the CDC or something like that. Yeah. And it'll just be an instant eye roll. And I guess I'm wondering, how do you, how do you really um, like insulate yourself against that? How do you plan for that ahead of time? Um, what's a way that I don't know. How do you diversify, I guess, your your portfolio of reliable resources so you have additional resources like ready if somebody questions yeah. what you use? That I think that is just couldn't be a better question. Um uh, and and understanding sort of what a behavioral scientist will tell you ab about people's identities are attached to certain media sources. You know, some people are just Fox News all the way. And it's really, really hard to reason with someone who is taking in that stuff day in, day out. It's a real huge problem. And so I don't know that I have much of an answer for that, except try not to get in an argument with them and try to stay calm. Because I think that, it, it, it again, tone is so important. If you're confident, if you can keep your voice from raising up to being some shrill, like finger wagging um, or, or judgmental, like that's so stupid, you're just wrong. Um, that kind of a conversation is just rarely productive. Again, I would go back to the, the uh, lighten up. Um, principle, which which might be like, you know what, Uncle Jerry, maybe we just aren't going to solve this problem today. Let's have some more turkey, you know? Um, so it's really hard, but I also think that this group, Tyler, could behave as some sort of a support group. I mean, back to the whole ment mental health and climate issue, which I've, I've become increasingly uh, enamored of because I've, I have had times when I just, just you know, ahead of the midterms recently, I literally was just like in bed 
you know, just like, no, taking a personal day. I cannot, I cannot deal with the dread and apprehension that I feel. And then it turned out like, okay. So now I'm like, okay. And then we had to have that lunar eclipse and da, 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 da. So, I mean, I think everyone is like a little traumatized here. We've, we've been living through a rough patch. And in fact, I, I mentioned to Tyler that um, the reason I was a little bit late joining today is that I just came back from an advisory board meeting of the Planetary Health Alliance, which is based at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I highly recommend this. Go to their website, planetaryhealthalliance.org. Like a bazillion resources. You can sign up as an individual member. It's free. And then you're part of this network internationally of scholars. And, you know, we're talking about creating a working group on uh, resilience and mental health and even spirituality so that there so that we have more of a support network and globally but yeah i mean this this can wear you down for sure is that a good note to wind up on tyler what do you think no, i think it's a great note to end on uh, <laughs> so thank you again uh sarah and thank you all again for attending this month's mentors chat. Um, this is actually our last mentor chat for 2022. So we will be taking December off. Um, we'll pick back up on January 26th, um, where we will get into visual science communication with the senior graphics editor for Scientific American, Jen Christensen. Um, there is also still space in our 2023 mentor chat series. So if you have a dream topic or guest mentor, let me know so we can keep these mentor chats catered to you. Um, the recording of our mentor chat, plus all of the resources that we mentioned, including Sarah's um, email and her Twitter account, will be posted in our Slack channel um, called Mentor Chats. It's pretty easy to find it. Um, and again, thank you all for coming. Thank you all very much.